great to be here. So uh, as Emily said, I, I used to work in forestry. And if some of you have been around a while, I may have spoken to you on that topic as well. Um, and I'm glad that you, you guys have Agnes in that position now, who is a great resource for you. And I already heard some chatter about maybe bringing her in for a training. But I got into this topic of shiitake uh, mushroom cultivation because when I was in that position, we were always looking for uh, things that forest landowners could do with their land to help them get as much value out of it as possible. And growing shiitake mushrooms, especially on logs, is a great way to do that because you can grow them in the shade. It's a way to use uh, uh, wood products from your property that aren't going to, um, that wouldn't otherwise be going for like veneer at high dollar value. Uh, and if you needed to thin your, your forest anyway for forest health, then here's something you might be able to do with that. So my title now is Sustainable Agriculture Coordinator. I work, uh, even though I'm a, I'm a University of Maryland Extension employee, I work primarily with and for Northeast SARE, Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education. So if you are, are a farmer or know someone who is, we have money to help farmers uh, do new things and learn new things. So that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> All right, uh, so I'm gonna go through an introduction uh, about some general stuff and then we'll dive into some more specific information about growing these things. So that's not a typo, there are two I's in this word and that's because shiitake, uh, the name comes from the tree that it, it grows on in this native land, the she tree. Uh, the scientific name is Lentinula idodes, and it is a fungus. So I love teaching this workshop for many reasons, but primarily because I get to tell my favorite joke. A mushroom walks into a bar. The bartender says, get out of here, you're not welcome. And the mushroom says, and I'm a fun guy. Oh. <laughs> Actually, that's a bad joke for in many ways. One is that it's not actually pronounced that way. It's fun, fun G, <laughs> but I can never resist anyway. So, um, fun G, do you have their own kingdom to themselves, separate from plants and animals, as Emily mentioned? Uh, oddly enough, they're more closely related to humans and to plants by uh, when you look at the DNA. So if you probably already noticed the handouts you have are an abridged version that are just the more of the details about how to actually do this stuff. I have a, a longer version here that are just kind of left over, but I can email the, the full version around as well. Uh, so these uh, fungi are commonly split into two categories, basically the ones that decompose dead stuff, they're saprotrophic, uh, and the ones that are parasitic that, just like it sounds, they live on live stuff. Uh, so those are, of course, the ones that we don't like to see because they're actively harming, uh, usually, the plants that we're trying to grow. Uh, they do have two main parts. There's the hyphae, which are root-like threads. They act a lot like roots, but because they're not plants, they don't have roots. So they branch and interweave and create a, a web or mat, and once they kind of fuse into that form, then they become known as mycelium. And that's the feeding structure, and really, it's the body of the organism. I, and that's the way I think of it, and a lot of people think of it. So they're uh, the ones that are absorbing nutrients and secreting enzymes that uh, break things down so they can absorb them. So then there's a the fruiting structure, and of course, when everyone says the word mushroom, that's what they think of. But it's really just this ephemeral thing that pops up once in a while out of this much larger uh, organism. So that includes basically almost anything that you'd see and think of as a, a fungus. The mushroom, shell fungi, puffballs, morels. Um, so this is, just like it sounds, the thing that sends out the spores, the, the fruit equivalents. And that can be from anywhere in the millions to the trillions of microscopic spores. And each one of those can grow into a new organism, but uh, of course many of them do not. It's more of like a blanket approach uh, more like the, the rabbits producing lots of bunnies than the, the elephants producing just you know one or, one or two offspring. So here's just a diagram. You probably know most of this already. Um, I won't spend any time on that. 
So the thing about the fruiting body is it only appears when the conditions are right. And this is really important when you're trying to grow this very thing. So there's got to be adequate moisture and adequate nutrients. Uh, this mycelium will continue to live and grow, but they don't necessarily have to put out that fruiting body if they don't feel that they have the resources and the right habitat to do so. The largest mycelium ever recorded was a honey mushroom fungus found in Oregon, uh, nine square kilometers of forest, 2,400 years old. So they're pretty fascinating organisms. So they do help with uh, nutrient cycling through decomposition, not just for themselves, but for any other uh, plants in the area. And they often do form symbiotic relationships uh, th through mycorrhizae with plants. And this uh, is one area that bridges into my current work. I talk a lot about soil health with farmers. And one of the, the, the things that the, the points we always try to make is that healthy soil uh, needs to be a, a thriving ecosystem. So it's not just a corn plant in sterile media. Uh, it's a corn plant with uh, an active ecosystem, including all kinds of invertebrates that are creating pores and, very importantly, fungus and these mycelia. Uh, the reason it's so important is that uh, a corn plant, for example, may have a, a root volume of, I don't know, a, a cubic yard, something like that. But the mycelial network, when everything is healthy and functioning well, can expand that by up to seven times the volume. So that mycelium is gathering nutrients from that much, much larger volume of soil and actually passing those nutrients through uh, points of fusion with the plant's roots in exchange for carbohydrates that the plant has created through photosynthesis. So it's this incredible uh, symbiotic relationship, not even between species, but across kingdoms. So I think that's just fascinating. And there's evidence that when you start looking at these relationships in trees, it gets even more complicated with trees, uh, almost intentionally sending resources through these networks to trees that are, that are um, unhealthy or that when a tree knows, it knows it's going to die, it will kind of bequeath its resources to other individuals. So um, this is like cutting edge research right now. And they do exude a glomalin as well, which is uh, a, a sticky substance that helps soil stick together and gives it a lot of very beneficial qualities, especially in terms of maintaining its structure when it rains. So that's just all to say fungi are very important to our soil ecosystem. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, there are specific species that have to be there. It's not like a, you can have a shiitake growing in your woods and that's going to provide all those services. They're, they're different, and, and this is a bit of a tangent because <laughs> um, the, the shiitake mushroom isn't one of those species that, that really does that. But um, I just like the opportunity to share my fascination with these <laughs> mycelial <laughs> relationships. Um, so, and that's just an illustration of what I was talking about. Uh, and then the, um, this hypogeus uh, fungal fruit here, that's just the, um, another type of fruiting body that would be completely underground, like a truffle. And there's just some illustrations there. Uh, when these mycelial strands kind of fuse and become uh, more like a root wood. I actually have specialized um, cells that are outside in a casing in, in interior vessels, and, they, and you can start calling them rhizomorphs. Um, if there's a, a, a sclerotia, is a, like a fungal equivalent of a tuber where it actually form a very dense, hard body that will act as a storage structure for uh, energy and nutrients. So. There's a lot more to that mushroom than meets the eye. Yeah. <laughs>
So when it comes to actually eating these things, there are some proven me medicinal benefits. Uh, they do have some antiviral, antifungal, and anti-tumor effects. Uh, they can significantly lower blood cholesterol levels and um, maybe even lower high blood pressure. And that's just in laboratory animals so far, I think. The shiitake in, in particular contains all eight essential amino acids in, in better proportions than many other foods, as well as many vitamins and minerals. So these are things that may be true. There's some kind of preliminary evidence, but nothing I would say is scientifically proven yet. Uh, they, they may have some anti-cancer benefits. Uh, they can stimulate immune systems, perhaps. Uh, they may have some antibacterial effects and may reduce platelet aggregation. Uh, specifically with shiitakes, there are very limited cases, about one in 50 of folks having allergies, but only when it's uncooked. So unlike portabella, uh, we always recommend that you do cook shiitakes before eating them. All right, so one of the reasons to grow these is you can make money. So. Um, how many of you are interested in maybe potentially down the road making some money from shiitake mushrooms? <laughs> okay, so I won't, that's kind of what I figured. I won't dwell too long on that. Um, but it, like I mentioned earlier, it is a way to make a use of, uh, if you have some woods and uh, you know you need to take some oaks down because they're in the way, they're competing with some other more healthy oaks, you can use that material to grow mushrooms on. And if you were going to sell them, you could make anywhere from $6 to $20 per pound. Uh, like anything, you'd want to make sure that the market is there before you invest a lot into uh, an enterprise. And if you want to get real serious, you, most people are thinking about doing 100 log starts per year, which would come out somewhere around $5,000 of income per year if you were, um, everything goes according to plan. So there's just some potential outlets. This is a really cool place in, uh, uh, what's it called, Embarcadero in San Francisco. So I just took many more pictures than what you see here, but you can see that the prices are quite high. <laughs> and I thought I'd show this, um, even if you don't want to sell the mushrooms, or in addition to selling mushrooms, you could sell these ready to go um, logs or um, kits kind of thing. All right, so how do you actually grow these things? So you got to choose your media. Um, there are several options, primarily sawdust, grain, and logs. So the sawdust and grain options, that's, that basically means you're growing in a plastic bag, and most of the time that would be indoors that requires a lot more work in capital investment, but it's uh, much more productive. It has a <clears throat> higher profitability ratio. Uh, I'm not gonna really talk about those. Those are a whole nother level up from growing on logs. Uh, you can grow on trees and stumps kind of as they lie in the forest. You're, you have a lot less control over that media, so uh, I won't spend too much time talking about that either. In terms of taste, there, are, there have been some uh, kind of limited scale studies showing that culinary experts or foodies, uh, you know, people who, who make a living out of food in one way or another, can actually tell the difference in the same species or strain of shiitake grown on one of these bag systems versus on a log system, and even between species of tree. Um, so if you, you know, any of us eat shiitakes from an oak this week and from, uh, I don't know, a, a beach two weeks from now, probably wouldn't be able to tell the difference necessarily, but th there, there are some differences there. Uh, it's pretty well known that the quality uh, and shelf life of shiitakes grown on a log are actually higher than the ones grown on bags. I don't know that anyone knows exactly why yet. Uh, and they also tend to have higher beta-glucan levels, which is one of those um, great health uh, uh, benefits. And again, tend to be fresher and, and 
last longer on the shelf and in the fridge. Uh, the labor is also less using logs because there's just less management to do and the production cost is less. Uh, so this looks like a log. This is actually a, um, kind of, it's not synthetic, but it's a man-made uh, log. And I just put this in here because I got the Torah mushroom facility for the first time um, last year. And this was actually, even though it's huge, you probably can't really tell, this is racks of these going back probably 100 feet, and there's, I think, three levels of them. And this was just a test scale operation to see if this company that's like the seventh largest in the country in growing Portobello, uh, if they can make a, a profit doing shiitakes on this type of log as well. But the interesting thing is they buy these logs from a third party, and even though there's this big powerful mushroom company, they still can't get that third party to tell them exactly what the ingredients are in the log, because <laughs> it's proprietary. <clears throat> but it's a mix of grains and sawdust and some other things, probably. All right, so back to uh, our normal person scale. So when you're looking for logs, of course, if you have them on your own property, that's great, but we're going to go into specifications for what you would need that may help you realize, well, maybe you don't actually have a great source on your own property. If that's the case, you can talk to firewood dealers, arborists, mills, loggers. Um, those three groups are almost always looking for ways to get rid of low quality wood. So um, even firewood dealers, um, you know, what, what you would be looking for would probably be able to become firewood at some point, but they may be willing to sell it to you for pretty cheap anyway. Uh, and then friends, neighbors, family, and clearing crews uh, where new houses are going in. If you are going to pay for them, uh, one to two dollars per uh, bolt if they're going to cut them for you is reasonable, or 50 cents per bolt if you're going to cut them yourself. And by bolt, I just mean something like this. We'll talk more about the dimensions later, but a bolt would be the, the unit that you're actually growing the, the mushrooms on. Um, the, it is a little better to get your logs in the winter. Um, it's worse, the, the worst time to get them is spring and, and fall, really, because when the, the juices in the tree are moving a lot, it loosens up the bark, and you really want the bark to stay on there as tightly as possible because it's going to keep the moisture in, which is very important. The type of media you, you use, the type of species you choose, uh, will determine in part how many flushes you can get per log. So a flush is when a whole bunch of mushrooms come out at once. And we're going to talk about how to make that happen. But the number of times you can, the number of harvests you can get off that log is going to vary to some extent based on the species. Um, again, there can be some effect on flavor depending on the species you choose. Uh, bark thickness and fastness is very important. Again, um, one of our main goals with creating this habitat that makes this mushroom very happy is to uh, retain a lot of moisture inside that wood. And the bark is your number one, number one ally in doing that. It's basically a, you know, just even when it was on the tree, it's nature's uh, kind of saran wrap, keeping the moisture inside. So white oak is pretty universally regarded as the best species for growing shiitake mushrooms on. Uh, and as we go through kind of down the list from best to worst in terms of species, one thing you'll see is that uh, species with a high density where the wood is uh, just more dense, has a higher specific gravity, basically packs more food for that organism into the same volume as a, a softwood would. Uh, so red oaks are similar. Um, they may have a longer bolt life, faster fruit development. Sugar maple is also excellent. And iron wood or hop horn beam is pretty good, less flavor. Uh, horn beam or muscle wood and beech are also pretty good. And then there's uh, another kind of tier includes birch, hickory, and red maple. Um, red maple, for example, is obviously we're getting less dense here, so there's in the same volume 
the same size bolt, you're going to have less food for that organism to, to chew on, which is going to end up with fewer pounds of mushrooms over the, the life of that bolt. Now we're into the, the stuff you, you don't want to use. Elm, poplar, black locust, ash, fruit trees, and any sort of evergreen or softwood. Um, and some of this is for flavor reasons. Some of them have, uh, can actually produce off flavors. And others are just, they just, they're not very compatible. There's just not enough food in there for the, to make it worth your while. If you are going to be cutting trees, just consider the effect on forest health. Um, no matter what sort of situation you have that you're uh, managing, if you do have some woods, um, there's probably some trees in there that could be cut and would benefit the other trees left behind. But you just want to be thoughtful when you do that. And there just happens to be a University of Maryland Extension uh, program called Woods in Your Backyard that can help you with that. <laughs> Uh, the amount of sapwood versus heartwood can also help determine the number of flushes and the pounds of mushrooms you can get out of that bolt. This is something you're not going to know until you actually cut the tree and, and look at the end of it. But heartwood is the darker part in the middle, sapwood is the lighter part around the outside. The uh, hyphae have trouble growing in that sapwood. That's basically where the tree has been storing all the, the junk it doesn't need. Um, so the heartwood is the, the juicy, tasty part. And if there's only a tiny, thin ring of that around the outside, you're going to get uh, less mushrooms out of it. So the, the ideal size of a bolt. Generally, it's three to four feet long, six to eight inches in diameter. Um, but more importantly, it's what you're comfortable picking up and moving, because you will have to pick up and move it around. As we get into talking about how to, how to force a flush, you actually, every time you want a flush of mushrooms to come out, you have to pick it up, put it in water, take it out of water, put it down. Um, so if you are going to be doing more than one log, you have to multiply that amount of work by the number of logs. Uh, so that's really the more, more important thing. Um, ideally, if you, are, if you do have a choice of season to harvest in, it's when the leaves are off the tree. Um, some places that, that this rule of thumb is kind of out there that you need to wait a certain number of weeks. Uh, and the theory is that there are tannins in the trees, which are natural preservatives, that are going to um, be detrimental to growth of the spawn. Uh, science has shown that that's not really the case, that there's no need to wait between cutting the log and inoculating. Um, even if the spawn can't grow quickly at first because maybe there are some tannins there. Uh, it's better to just get everything in there and sealed up as quickly as possible. Um, and then the more sugar in the, the tree, the better, but that's a little hard to, to manage. So ideally, you do inocul inoculate within three weeks of cutting the tree. Um, so again, one of our main goals is to keep moisture inside that bolt. And as soon as you open up those ends, moisture is going to be evaporating out. So we don't want that. Uh, and part of the inoculation process is sealing that up. And also, every day that you don't introduce your own fungus is another opportunity for a wild fungus to infect that log and get ahead of you. Uh, so when it comes to choosing a strain, so. Uh, we're only talking about shiitakes today, but even within shiitakes, just like there are varieties of, of garden vegetables, there are varieties of shiitakes. Um, there are three categories. So wide range is generally what people start with and what a lot of people use um, until they get at a really high level of production. Just like it sounds, it has a wide range of growing conditions that it finds acceptable. And it's pretty fast and reliable. Um, and then there are the, the two shoulder season uh, categories as well. So warm weather, it does well in hot weather. Your soak water, instead of being cold, like for wide range, should be a little warmer. And then cold weather is best in those shoulder seasons. Um, it takes longer for the spawn to uh, colonize the bolt. And it doesn't respond well to shocking, which means you just kind of have to let it 
do its own thing. You don't have much control over when the, the fruiting bodies are actually going to pop out. So this is just an example. I know you can't read this, um, but you can probably still make out that this is uh, a calendar. And at the top, we have the uh, wide range varieties. And the red bars are when it responds well to shocking, which is soaking it in cold water. So you can see how those bars are pretty wide. And then uh, down here, these three uh, are the warm months. So they, uh, like this one, for example, has has very low response rate to, to cold uh, to cold water shocking or, or shocking at all. And then when we get into the cold weather, uh, it doesn't respond to, or sorry, I said that back, backwards. The, the red is when it responds to the cold water shocking. So you can see it, the um, natural fruiting starts earlier um, for the warm weather, but it won't produce as much. So the cold weather uh, doesn't respond to shocking at all. And you just kind of have to take what you get in those shoulder mounts. And this is on uh, one of the main providers of supplies and spawn is this field and forest. There's also fungi perfecti. There's some others out there. Um, there's a guy actually in Southern Maryland. I can't remember the name, so that's not very helpful. But if you're interested in, in shopping around, uh, I can help you with that individually. Uh, so anyway, this is available online through this field and forest company. So when it comes to getting spawn, so spawn is the living fungus that is in a form that allows you to inoculate a bolt. Uh, so, and I'll show you some of that in just a minute. But it comes in several different forms, and there's a, a third one here too. So sawdust is what I have over here, and it's just like what it sounds. It's sawdust that has the mycelia running through it, ac actively growing through that media. And it's a lot like, uh, it's almost the same, that, same thing you'd use to grow mushrooms out of if you were doing that high volume, um, high labor, high production system when you're growing in bags. But in this case, we're just using little pieces of it to inoculate a log with that spawn. Dowels are similar, except they're dowels. I think they're actually um, from, like they're what you would use to put your IKEA furniture together. But uh, they've been inoculated, so they've got the, the fungus growing through them. And with sawdust, I'll show you the type of inoculator you have to have to use the sawdust. With a dowel, you just use a hammer and, and pound it into a hole in the log. The third kind is um, a thimble. And I, I was searching for this yesterday to get some photos. I couldn't find it because I, I was using the wrong word. They used to call them plugs. But now dowels and plugs are the same, and they call them thimbles instead. So anyway, it looks like a thimble. And um, it has a, a cap on the top. So with one piece, you can just use your thumb, push it into a hole, and then it's already sealed on top. So these are much more expensive than any of these. But if you're only doing one or two logs, it's not a bad deal because it makes everything much easier. So you're going to need to drill some holes. I think I'll migrate over here at this point. Yeah, before I go into drilling, I'll just show you what I was talking about. So this is the spawn. So this is strain WR46. That's one of the most common, popular strains. It's pretty much what everyone starts with. Um, when this was full, I think it was five pounds and $25. Unfortunately, the shipping is like another $20 on top of that because it's a live thing. They got to get to you fast. This has been in my fridge for too many months, probably. There's probably, it would probably still work. It's just not the best thing because, like I said, it's a living organism. Putting it in the fridge slows it down, but it doesn't completely put it into suspended animation. So that whole time in the fridge has been slowly chewing through the food in this bag. And I can feel it's, it's pretty light, too. Um, so anyway, if you look at it, it's just like a white coated thing. But that's just the, that kind of mycelial mat that's enclosed the rest of it. So if you look inside, it's kind of like mushy sawdust. When it's new, it looks more like normal sawdust. And this is the inoculator. So 
as I was doing that, it was filling up this chamber on the bottom, right? So we'll get to that in a second. Um, so that's that. So now on to drilling. Um, there are different types of drills, of course. So you don't want a wireless drill. They're not powerful enough. I usually have a corded drill with me. It's like a contractor grade. It doesn't have to be contractor grade. And if you look on the label, any drill will tell you the RPM. And I think mine is around 1,200 RPM. So that works fine. Um, it means that when you're drilling, it's like this, right? <laughs> um, so if you imagine doing that times the number of holes in a log, uh, and you're doing more than one log, that can get old, right? So the other option is an angle grinder. This is a normal angle grinder, except that it has a purpose-built adapter so that you can put a drill bit in it. Uh, and this is a purpose-built drill bit. And it has a, f a couple neat things. That's one up there, too. Uh, it has the, the little kind of tap screw that makes it very easy to get started. And then it's got this big, uh, I don't know what to call it. It's like a, it's got a cutter blade on it. So it's not really a, it acts more like, um, what does it act more like? A router. A router, yeah, thank you. Um, and the reason for that is that it makes really big chips and it just throws them out of the hole. You can use a traditional drill bit. Uh, you just get more sawdust in the hole, which means less room for your spawn. So these bits, I think, are around $12. Uh, back to the drill for a second, though. So that is spinning instead of 1,200. This is around 10,000 or 12,000 RPM. Uh, yeah, you just take my word for it, I guess. It's on here somewhere. Oh, there it is, 11,000. Um, and it also has this... Um, so, I won't do it now, make a big mess, but instead of it's more like zip, 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 zip. So, again, this is, I know you guys are probably not going to go home and start a thousand logs, but um, if you do, <laughs> these are important considerations. Uh, okay, and then I'll just look at, here's the, um, here's the, like the, the Ferrari of shiitake mushroom drills. This is actually purpose-built. And it's even the handle is designed for it, 150 bucks. There's only when I went to buy this one, I looked for one of these, and there I couldn't find any. But now there's one place that offers them for 150 dollars. So the bit you can uh, well, first of all, it's very important that the bit size matches the size of um, hole you need. Of course, the size hole you need needs to match one of these if you're using one of these or the size of the dowel if you're using dowels. And those are two different sizes. So like it says, 5 sixteenths for the dowel or 7 sixteenths for the sawdust. So when you're drilling the holes, that's the spacing, you want to do about 3 inches uh, to 3 to 4 inches apart. Do I have, I don't, uh, I didn't include my nifty graphic unfortunately, but basically you want a diamond pattern. So you have rows that are about 3 inches apart and then they're staggered so that you end up with diamonds. So keep in mind your goal here is inoculation, which means when you're done with your job, the spawn will be implanted in this log in a way that makes it as easy as possible for it to crawl its way through the inside of the log and colonize that volume as quickly as possible. So the more holes you drill, uh, the quicker that's going to happen and probably the more quickly you'll have mushrooms to eat. But the more holes you drill, the more food you're removing from the system, and the longer it takes to do, and the more spawn material it takes to make that happen. So there's kind of a balance there, and this is the formula that has, uh, is the happy medium between all of those things. And the depth is 1.25 inches, so that's automatically set by the special bit. If you use a normal drill bit, um, you either got to mark it with like masking tape or something, or they do make little stops you can, with a set screw you can put on. Okay, any questions so far? Alright. What, what, what kind of log is this? Uh, I think this is a white oak. 
Um, this is just a demonstration. It's an old one. Uh, okay, so you got to fill the holes. We kind of talked about that, uh, but just to actually demonstrate this for real, so you just kind of fill up that chamber, and then this is a thumb model. So you use your thumb, and you use a plunger, and you put it down, and you plunge it in there, and it leaves just the right amount. Um, you can see it sticks out a little bit. That's on purpose. That's so you have a little cup for the next step. Uh, if you are using dowels, you're just hammering them in. So the next step is sealing those holes, because if you don't seal them, um, this is moist stuff, and it's going to dry out really quickly before that spawn has a chance to actually crawl into the log, uh, and we don't want that. So those thimbles I mentioned, they have the cap already on them. That's one of the reasons they're, they're neat, because the most popular other method is wax. So this is cheese grade wax. Um, this is a Walmart griddle. You just plug in. I just don't have the plug on it. So it, you're gonna have you're gonna set this to 350 to 400. It's kind of awkward. I just kind of like hold this like this until it looks like enough, and then I take it out. And usually it tries to fall over and skate around. <laughs> That's fun. Uh, I had tried cutting it once. I did not try a second time. Um, I guess I could heat my knife. I never tried that. Anyway, um, so it's basically hot enough when you see wisps of smoke starting to come up. It'll smell like something's happening. Um, and then it, you get these daubers. Uh, so this is a used one, which works just fine. They're just little soft, cottony things. And then you know you want all this to be close together because you're dipping in the wax and then daubing. And it's kind of neat and very satisfying because when you daub, it sizzles. Uh, anyone know why it sizzles? Yeah, you're boiling the, it's 350 degrees, so you're boiling the water off that's in there. Um, but it very quickly um, solidifies and makes a nice little seal. If you have a big um, missing uh, spot with missing bark, you can, if you want to take the time and the wax, you can seal that up. That'll help a little bit. You probably do want to seal at least one end because that's even more important than here because the, the tree has vessels, pipes going this way. So it's going to lose a lot more moisture at the end than it will here. Um, some people debate whether to do both ends or not. There may be some advantage if you have it standing up on a moist ground to maybe absorb some water through the bottom. I'm not, I don't know that I agree with that, but that's what some people say. And then, also important is labeling. And that's one thing I was out of, but you can see right here, it's one of these tree labels you've probably seen before. And they're designed so that you can use a ballpoint pen and the ink won't show up, but it indents uh, the metal. So, here it says WR46 10, 15, 16. So that's really the important information you need, right? The variety, if you're ever going to experiment with the strains, you'd want to know that. And the date, so you can keep track of how old the log is and when it might be time to cycle it out. So here's just some photos from one of my workshops. This poor rider there got stuck with the slow drill. <laughs> My friend Shane Brill took these very nice photos. You see it sizzling. There we go. Yeah. How long can you wait until after you cut the tree down or the tree is fresh? Can you wait a month? A month would be fine. A year, probably not so much. Remember, um, probably the, the worst thing about waiting is, again, the, the other competing stuff that's floating around in the environment can get a head start on your sh shiitake and start out competing it. Um, so, and it's losing moisture and, and there's, yeah. So I'd say uh, if it's in the winter and months that you're waiting, it's not such a big deal because th most things are dormant anyway, but in the summer I'd, I would do maybe six weeks at the most, ideally, yeah. Uh, 
Okay, so then what happens? Well, you gotta store this thing. Well, here's the bad news, and this is, this is worse bad news when we're in a workshop and people are all excited about taking their logs home and, and picking, uh, harvesting mushrooms the next day. Um, <laughs> it doesn't work like that. <laughs> Um, so you want to store it in the shade at least 60%. You want to maintain internal moisture greater than 30%, 35 or more is best. Uh, and they make uh, gauges for this actually for firewood, because firewood you want it to be low. They're not great, but they're better than nothing if you, don't, if you just have no idea. Um, and you, ideally if they're not getting rained on regularly, you, it's good to water them for just like a sprinkle or a soaker hose drizzle for 12 hours, one to two times a month um, if you really want to keep it a happy environment in there. You, even though you want moisture inside the log, you don't want moisture outside the log because that would um, encourage rot from other fungi. So you, do you want good air circulation? And uh, you can do that through stacking, like a Lincoln log thing, where you got two, and then two, and two, and two. That will be sufficient air circulation. Or just leaning it. Um, do I have a, I I have a picture? The, um, you can do an A-frame thing. There's some pictures in this, these materials up here, too. Um, you can have a, one board running down the middle, and then you can lean them up on both sides if you're going to get serious about it. Uh, so you can store these indoor, and, and I have a lot of workshop participants who do this because they just have one log. Um, someone even dedicated a whole extra bathtub to it, <laughs> uh, which is very convenient. And that, of course, does lengthen the growing season because they never go dormant. If they are outdoors, you can cover them in the winter. Um, temperature does affect their metabolism and how fast they, they grow and flush. So the spawn run, this is the bad news I was talking about. So the spawn run is how long it takes the spawn to get from inside whatever um, material you're using throughout the rest of the log to the point where it has kind of, they've kind of like talked to each other and said, okay, I think we're pretty comfortable here now. Let's start having babies. <laughs> so it can take four to eight months, or it will take four to eight months. And the way you know it's done is you start seeing it at the end, not the butts, where it's actually reached the end of the road, right? Um, so when you see that, that's your signal. Okay, I can start forcing some mushrooms. And you may even see some mushrooms coming out on their own by this point. So now we're gonna talk about shocking. So this gets confusing, because I told you that it's good to water the logs to keep the moisture up during the spawn run, and that's true. That's different than shocking them. Uh, water, watering them is, uh, you can soak them too, uh, but only for two, two hours or so uh, for watering. When we're shocking, uh, we want them to be 24 to 48 hours in cold water. And there's some evidence that the vibration of actually moving them around may help, so if you just wanna like knock them around a little more, maybe that will help. <laughs> um, if you do have more than one log and you want a new flush every week, you can have a rotation. You need eight logs to get one every week because they gotta rest seven, about seven weeks between each flush. Um, yeah, and those tags can help you with that too if you wanna number them and it will help you keep track. So, do I have this in here? Okay, so basically if you put it in water on Saturday, and you leave it in overnight, you take it out on Sunday, um, you should see some pinning in maybe Tuesday, which is tiny little pinpoints coming out, out of the wood, and that's the, the top of the cap, and it'll come up, and then the cap kind of opens like this, right? So this is about when you want to harvest it. I might be getting ahead of myself here. When, when there's still a little bit of curl on the edge of that cap. As soon as it starts to flatten out, then it starts cracking, and it's, it's still edible, but it's just not quite as good. It's starting to dry out a little bit at that point as well. Um, so that would probably be about on Friday. So then if you had eight of them, that next Saturday you could start the process all over again, so you would have mushrooms every Friday. Um, so you could get about eight ounces per flush of 
of fresh mushrooms. And over the, the lifetime of a bolt, that's about three to four pounds. It doesn't sound like much, but mushrooms don't weigh very much. So um, I never looked for a volume equivalent, but that's, that's a good pile of mushrooms. Uh, consider covering them, especially when they're flushing, so after you shock and before you harvest. That's when they're very vulnerable, obviously, to rain and wildlife. Um, these companies sell like special cloth for the, the purpose, but you don't really need that. You could use plastic or, or something else or netting. Uh, again, harvest before the cap is flat. The one pest, so really there's not much in just that span of time that can infest or infect your mushrooms. Usually either they're going to get eaten by squirrels. I mean, these are, the, these are the bad things that could happen. They could get eaten by squirrels or you may get thrips. So thrips are tiny little insects. The nice thing is uh, you can basically just kind of tap. You hold it right side up because they're inside the gills. They're eating the spores. They're not actually eating the, the mushroom itself. So you tap the, the mushroom and they'll just fall out. Um, so the nice thing is when you only have one log, you can bring it inside while it's fruiting. And even if it's too dry in your basement for it to normally get enough moisture, um, then you don't have to worry about squirrels and that sort of thing. And again, rest six to eight weeks between flushes. Oh, there's a picture I was thinking of. So that's what all of your backyards will look like a year from now. <laughs> so, yeah? Are they coming when, after the flushing? Are they actually coming out through the bar? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're powerful little things. Yeah. Um, so you can store them for up to a month before they're considered <laughs> dried. Um, and the best thing to do is just put them in a paper bag, roll the top shut, and put them in your fridge. And basically you can eat them until they just look too dry to be appetizing. And then if you just keep them in there indefinitely, then they're, then they're just dried mushrooms and then you can um, reconstitute them in hot water and they're fine. And then you have a nice mushroom broth as well. Uh, but ideally, after you, just one, within one hour of harvesting, that's, you want to get them in the fridge within one hour of harvesting. And you can use a knife, but you can just kind of twist them off too. So you may occasionally see some competing fungi. Uh, if you have a lot of logs, you want to separate the ones that have been infested with competing fungi just so you're not helping them spread to your other logs. The good news is there's really nothing that competes that looks anything like a shiitake mushroom. So there's some little bracket fungi on here, but there's no way you confuse that with a shiitake. Uh, so there's no reason to stop harvesting just because you see an, another mushroom on there. Uh, wildlife is really the, the big pain in the neck. Uh, if you are thinking about selling them, one pound fresh is about three ounce dried, uh, which sells for half the price. So you lose a lot of value if you're going to sell them by drying them, but of course they keep forever and um, can have a bigger inventory. And you can make some nice value added things as well. There's just some dollar values. So yeah, I did see $92 per pound dried online, which when you um, Look at the fresh value, it's about $17, which is about the same fresh. So, um, you know, there's people out there who will pay a lot for this sort of thing. So, I will stop there. I just had a couple neat other fungi examples, but are there any questions? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I should have made that more clear. So if you don't do that whole shocking thing, you, you will probably still see mushrooms on the log. It just won't be on a schedule. It'll probably be a week after it gets a heavy rain, for example. Um, and the total output of that log over its lifespan probably won't be nearly as much. But it's a lot less work. Um, and just in terms of what you might actually use to submerge it, uh, if you have a stream, fresh water running through your, your property. There's not really any good reason not to use that. Um, you, I mean, I guess there's 
if there's Giardia in your stream, is it really going to get on your mushroom and infect you? I, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I think the chance of that is pretty low. Um, but other options would be like I, I've used a, a big clean garbage can. I mean, I have one that I've never used for anything else that I dunk them in. Of course, they want to be roughly the right size. If they stick out the top, then you can take it out, turn it around, put it back in halfway through. Um, of course, bathtub, uh, livestock trough, you know, there's options. Um, but if you don't, then you can just let it do its thing and it'll, I mean, it's just like, to some extent, it's like the mushrooms you see in your lawn that they just pop up when the con conditions are good. So, yeah. Yeah? Um, the term uh, mushroom bathing. No. <laughs> I'm interested to hear more, though. <laughs> okay, I was there, but I wasn't there for that talk. So. Yeah. And number two, um, the Michael Rizzi again. When you see the, in the magazines, five packets, this Michael Rizzi picks it up. I mean, yeah, so there are, it is pretty well known for some species that you want to benefit what strains and species of fungus you need to do that. So I don't, um, I think there is some science there. I, what The part that I am less convinced of is, um, you know, how do you know that that fungus is not already in your lawn doing its thing? Uh, and I don't know if there's really an easy way to, to tell that or not. Yeah. So, I mean, it, there are, um, it's fairly common to, to in a, on a large scale ag, agronomic crop um, basis to buy inoculated seeds that have that correct fungus on, on the seed already. So it's not, um, it's not like there's no science behind it, but I, I'm not entirely convinced on a landscape scale whether there is science that it will help the average landowner. Do you have a question? Oh, I read about the Yeah? Okay. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> Yeah. How long does a log last? Oh yeah, I meant to mention that. So if you're doing this cycle I described, probably three to five years. Um, noting that it'll, if, unless it's in your house, indoors in the winter, it'll go dormant for the three winter months or so. Um, so three to five years of a flush every eight weeks during the summer months. <laughs> so yeah. But again, it's a pretty low. Um, Low input type of system. I also meant, meant to show you this. Um, these are oyster mushrooms, but uh, it's just a, another example of, I mean, this is, they grow out of this bag. Like I, I, the instructions are to cut one side open, so the, the back side is cut open. But this is kind of a neat analogy to see, you know, it looks very similar. This was probably $25 for this little thing, and this was $25 for this commercial size, um, big thing. And you could, you, uh, I haven't tried this, but I think you could buy one of these that is designed to use for inoculant and just grow mushrooms out of it if you want. It would be uh, kind of a shortcut. <laughs> and I think they sell them that are a little more designed for that, but they're probably more expensive too. So. Hmm? Yeah, I mean I think I think they do a pretty good job of chewing through whatever food is in there. So if you split it to different bags, you'd probably get maybe the same amount of mushrooms in a faster amount of time. I'm speculating, but yeah. Do you really have to inoculate the log one time? Yes. Yeah. Any others? What happens during the eight weeks? Like, why do you need to wait? 
Well, it's using a certain amount of energy and resources to put those fruiting bodies out. So it just needs time to rest and recover. Um, I haven't, honestly, I haven't seen any documentation of what happens internally if you don't wait that long. I would guess that you're going to deplete its resources and if you did that a lot, you'd have, the, every slush you'd probably have fewer mushrooms and you'd probably be kind of setting that log back um, instead of kind of being able to do a regular cycle. Yeah. Any others? Well, here's just a couple things to leave you with. Fairy rings, nothing to do with the hockeys again, but fairy rings are pretty amazing. Um, and, and if you didn't know, they're actually uh, a fungus that's spreading out from a central point. And I believe where the dark spot is, it, um, is where the, the fungus is actively growing. And sometimes, I don't know if I have a picture. Yeah, you, you see, this is kind of like a scorched earth approach because it's actually robbed nutrients from where it's been. Um, so that's kind of neat. And then uh, Michaela mentioned the cedar apple rust, which is another really cool fungus. It's cool unless you have apple trees, I guess. <laughs> um, so you may know this is the, the apple stage of its life, life cycle, and it needs both apple and cedar to complete its life cycle. So these are the stages it goes through. See these alien looking pods? So if you've never seen one of these, it's quite startling if you don't know what it is. You may not know the final stage. Uh, well, there's, there's almost final stage. And there's the last one. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I have. <laughs> uh, if there are any final questions, I can take them. But otherwise, thank you for having me. <laughs> Yeah, oh, and I should have mentioned my resources. Um, this is kind of like the Bible. This comes out of Cornell. You can download it for free online. Um, it has pretty much anything you could possibly want to know. A lot of my information can, comes from here. There's some other shorter versions. This is also from Cornell. This is one that my colleague Jonathan Kayes did many years ago. This focuses more on the enterprise, the financial. This is just kind of another version that comes with the spawn when you get it. And here's the field and forest catalog. And here is uh, just a longer version of the presentation, or has more of the slides. So again, thanks and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>